Question one. Uh, about corporate art group three. Do you agree? Why or why not? So group one, sorry, group three uh, disagrees with this statement. They think that actually corporate art does try to say something uh, and that it tries to be some kind of socially conscious or tries to promote some kind of social value. Uh, and the example that they bring up is the recent uh, Marvel series She-Hulk, especially in the first two episodes. The first episode is basically about um, I can't remember her name, Jen. Uh, Jen arguing with her brother, the Hulk, about how uh, he doesn't have to teach her about controlling her emotions because as a woman, she has had to control her emotions her entire life. But in the second episode, it ends with Jen twerking, which is a more sexual kind of dancing. And so uh, group three says that uh, this kind of social messaging that corporate art is trying to push 
uh, does not seem to be good for society because on the one hand it's saying that uh, we should help women or allow women to be independent people. But on the other hand, it seems to be saying mm -hmm. that the kind of independence that leads to is a kind of sexualized independence. Something it, is that about right? Yeah, OK, thank you. Um, and I think that's very interesting. As I mentioned to group three, both ideas come from the same show. So uh, like we can say that one half is good, right? We should allow women to become independent. But when the show uh, keeps pushing that message to the next step, uh, it then it seems to go in a different direction. Um, so perhaps uh, group three, uh, in disagreeing with this statement, uh, is actually pointing to uh, another kind of limitation with corporate art. Um, we can imagine maybe that there is a kind of uh, corporate art that um, does allow, for example, female characters to become independent and self-reliant uh, and good examples of like a human being. And yet, uh, when we look at actual examples, the idea of independence gets uh, dragged into somewhere that does not seem to promote this same message. Uh, and if we do think about this as a kind of contradiction, then like the positive side and the negative side cancel each other out. And so you end up again with nothing or maybe something worse than nothing. Um, so I find it very interesting that uh, group three thinks that they disagree with this statement, but the example that they bring up actually confirms the same statement. Um, so maybe this sentence is too simple. Maybe we can say that corporate art often uh, tries to look socially conscious but in fact, uh, the values that they end up promoting are not actually socially conscious progressive values. Would you, do, uh, group three, do you think that's a fair understanding of your idea? Okay. Right. Um, usually when we talk about a work of art, we try to set aside um, or we, we try to look at more than what we think the author is trying to do. The author creates a work of art for some kind of reason, and usually, as you say, we can see that reason in the art. But a work of art can do more than what its author wants it to do. So in your example, OK, yes, the first episode trying to promote uh, Jen as an independent woman seems obviously like what the show is trying to do. But in the second episode that ends with Jen twerking, that may not fit with the same message, but it's also part of the artwork. And so when we look at a piece of art, uh, whether it is what the artist wanted to do or whether it is something that uh, was done like for some other reasons or like maybe just f as a joke. Uh, we can always look at the work of art uh, together as a whole. Um, and so uh, the example that you guys brought up just happens to be in, in, like this, right? One half is an obvious message. The other half is kind of like a joke and it feels like the joke part is working against the obvious message but both are part of the same work of art. Um, when we appreciate or enjoy or view a work of art, uh, we don't have to be able to see which parts are intentional and which parts are just for fun before we try to analyze what's going on. Like, as you guys said, when you go see a Marvel movie, 
uh, usually we don't sit there thinking, oh, what is it trying to tell us? Right? Usually we go for the action, the excitement, the entertainment. Uh, but whether it's something that the movie wants us to think about, or whether it's something that the movie wants to use to entertain us with, we are taking it in either way. So when we think about a work of art, we should try to think of it as a whole and not just like different parts. So yes, uh, you when you say that you can tell what the filmmaker is trying to do, uh, I agree, that part is very obvious. But there are other parts where uh, may, it may not fit in the same message, uh, it may not be part of what the filmmaker is trying to do, but it's still part of the same artwork. And so it has the same level of validity. Does that make sense? Kind of? Um, you know, when you bring up the example of She-Hulk, I have so many different things to say, um, but I'll leave that for after our main discussion because it can get very complicated. Uh, do other groups want to add ideas about question one? OK, let's move on to question two. Group four, there's an author's note on page nine. Why is that important to be there? OK, so let's take a look at where this author's note is. Let's start from the bottom of page eight. When independent artists release material featuring actual deviant sexuality, though. And then the author's note uh, clarifies the meaning of the word deviant. Um, if you look at a dictionary, the word deviant means um, different in a wrong way, like morally wrong difference. Uh, in Chinese, I guess we can call this dao de pian cha. And so the author's note says, due to repeated misunderstandings, I feel compelled to clarify here that I mean the word deviant from a mainstream cultural viewpoint. And then after the note, the author gives two examples of deviant uh, sexuality from a mainstream cultural viewpoint, gay content and incest. So uh, group four tells us that this note is important because the author wants us to know that she, the author, is not saying these kinds of sexualities are wrong. She's saying that the mainstream culture thinks that these kinds of sexuality is uh, maybe not wrong, but morally not perfect. It's morally questionable. So my follow up question to group four is why is this note important? Why does the author want us to 
be sure that it is not she herself who is calling these deviant. Uh, okay, so group four says that it's important to the author because she wants to support independent artists who work with these less common kinds of sexuality. And so this brings up an interesting question, which is. We have read this essay. We understand that the author supports these kinds of independent artists. So the meaning should be clear. Why does she have to add another author's note to explain something that we already understand? Thank you. Yes, so group four adds that we understand the author's support because we have finished the essay. But for a first time reader uh, who maybe disagrees very much with the author and does not have to read this essay in class, maybe that reader stopped at this point. And so they didn't get the, the full picture of what the author is trying to say. In other words, if somebody came across this essay on the internet uh, and they were reading not to understand but like to to find a target to find something to argue against this would be a place where that reader maybe might be able to argue against the author based on her use of this word deviant um, and in fact, the author herself mentions this kind of reader in this essay. I can't remember where, but I remember she mentions it. Ah, yes, it, right in paragraph one. Well, not paragraph one. Uh, where is it? It, a place where she talks about people who. Ah, sorry, so um, she mentions someone with a similar attitude, which is in paragraph two. Uh, line three. People who have such deep concern for the safety and social equality of their traumatized peers and the traumatized in their own ranks, so among themselves, can only be admirable. Uh, it's, it's a good thing, but more often than not, the form it takes is mass harassment and scapegoating, targeting not institutions or major studios, but independent creators, many of them marginalized themselves. So many of them also come from uh, less common backgrounds. So we can imagine that somebody who might argue against the author about the, using the word deviant might be uh, somebody who has a similar mindset. They see something that they don't agree with and without bothering to read the rest of the essay, they immediately post a reply to the author, scolding her for calling gay people deviant or something like that. Their intentions are good, 
right? They want to ensure that people don't think of gay people as deviant. Uh, but the way they do that ignores the larger point that the author is trying to make. And so uh, to prevent that kind of situation, the author here adds this author's note. Um, for we who are reading carefully in class, this note is not very necessary. We would not think that the author would call gay people and people who talk about incest deviant. But for someone on the internet who is reading very fast or reading to find an enemy, uh, putting this author's note here prevents them from attacking the author based on this misunderstanding. So like this note is interesting not only for what it says, but for the fact that the author thinks it is necessary to put this note here. In an essay talking about people attacking each other on the internet, the author also has to be careful to prevent people from attacking her. OK, thank you. Uh, do other groups have, want to add ideas about this question? OK, let's take a short break. I may chant okay, let's mention your my cub and okay, let's him go on my.
OK, let's continue. Question three. On page nine, the essay gives us some examples of positive effects that uncomfortable art can have. Uh, group five, do you agree that uncomfortable art could have these kinds of effects? So group five agrees uh, with this idea that uncomfortable art can bring us some positive effects that maybe other kinds of art cannot. And the reason is because uh, they focus on uh, line four from the bottom. So this is paragraph two, page nine, paragraph two, and then line four from the bottom. Art is the lifeblood of human connection and introspection. It is the foremost way in which we can confront our own weaknesses and failings. So if art truly is so important in building human connections, self understanding and helping us face our weaknesses and failures. How does art do that? Uh, and group five is saying that art that makes you uncomfortable can do that. Um, because think about it, why does a piece of art make you uncomfortable? Maybe it uh, presents something that you don't agree with. Maybe it presents something that makes you remember like a, a bad memory or something bad that happened in your life or that you heard about. And yet all of these things are part of life. You only hear about these stories or know about these stories because somebody has experienced this kind of thing. And so uh, taking in art that makes us uncomfortable means exposing ourselves to different kinds of human experience that we may not want to experience, but that some other people may have uh, been forced to experience. And so it helps us to connect with those people. And if the reason that art makes us uncomfortable is because of our own feelings or our own uh, weakness or failure or shame, then this art can give us a new perspective on those negative feelings. And that new perspective can also help us to understand why we have those feelings. And in understanding why, we have more control over those feelings. So um, this paragraph, also has another very important idea, starting on line two. If we take away uncomfortable art, what's left for the people who make their living and or maintain their sanity by approaching our own suffering from a place of skill, assurance, and safety? It seems like the idea here is that someone who may need the skill, assurance, and safety of good art in order to be able to face some bad experiences in their life. When something terrible happens to us, uh, one common reaction is to continue to ask ourselves, why? Why did this happen? Why did it happen to me? Uh, the word trauma originally means 
a serious wound or a serious hole in the body. So a mental trauma, we can understand it as uh, some part of our experience that is so terrible that we can't really understand why it happened or how it fits into the bigger story of our lives. It's a lack of understanding, a lack of control. And if uh, for this kind of mental trauma, a work of art that uh, addresses a similar experience with skill, which means control, assurance, which means intention. They know the artist knows what they're doing. And safety. This kind of art perhaps can help someone with this kind of mental trauma to uh, look at their experience uh, in a safer way, in a more controlled way, and perhaps might help them to close off the hole in their mind because of that experience. Um, as this paragraph says in line five, near the end. What's left for people struggling with the isolation of abuse who have no support and no words to help them name it? So notice how this sentence connects two ideas. On the one hand, support. And the other idea is some way to name that experience. So it seems like uh, to be able to face and get over or try to begin healing from mental trauma, one important step is to be able to use words to describe it, to be able to use words to give it a kind of shape. Because if you can give it a shape, then you can control that shape. And if you can control the trauma, the trauma will no longer be controlling you. Uh, OK, so do other groups want to add to this question? Uh, OK, let's move on to question four, group one. So. In, on page 10, the essay says two things. One, it's OK to not want to engage with uncomfortable art. But it also says that we should try to reach beyond what we are comfortable and familiar with. So group one, do you think this is a contradiction? OK, group one thinks that these two ideas are not a contradiction, that we can do both. Uh, and the reason why is because they, these two ideas are talking about different things. The first idea is basically we should not force other people uh, to view a certain kind of art. Like art is a personal connection 
uh, and we should allow people to choose what kind of art they want to view. At the same time, we should, the second point, encourage people to seek out new, different, and maybe uncomfortable kinds of art. But we shouldn't force them. And so we can do both of these things at the same time. That's your idea? Yeah? Okay. Uh, yeah. And um, in fact, the same person can do both things at the same time. Sometimes we want to read like a powerful, heartbreaking, sometimes even horrific work of art. Sometimes we just want to watch a Marvel movie. Uh, same person at different points in their life may want or need different kinds of art. And that's OK. Uh, and this essay doesn't talk about this, but we can even say that escapism is also important. Like you guys are busy, right? Taking like 200 classes, you have homework every night. Uh, your, your life is already stressful enough. Sometimes you just need to sit back, take a break, watch something entirely unimportant. And that can also help you with uh, getting on in your own life day after day. So this essay argues that uncomfortable art is important, but at the same time, as this question helps us to understand, it is saying that uh, not just uncomfortable art is necessary. All kinds of art is necessary. Thank you. Um, other groups, do you want to add to this question? OK, let's move on to question five, group two. What do you think is the central point of this essay and how can you tell? And you guys are within microphone range. Uh, I think the central point the author is trying to make, to put it in very simple words, is that she doesn't like how people are bashing on others who uh, dislike these type of art that covers controversial topics and praising corporate art because uh, art that exists that covers these uh, more negative contents, topics, generally bring more value uh, other than just the negative ones. I think that's, that's it. Okay. Thank you. So group two gives us a two-part answer. The first part is the author thinks that we should not um, be so harsh against artists who create uncomfortable or controversial art. And the second part is that uh, at the same time, we should think more about the kind of corporate art that most of us see. And the author connects these two parts. She's uh, the reason she brings up corporate art is because most to her, most of the people who are so against controversial art are also huge fans of corporate art. Uh, the idea of corporate art is not uh, necessarily connected to uh, what the author wants to talk about, but it's precisely because it's the, to her it's the same group of people. So when she wants to talk about why these people hate controversial art, she also has to talk about why they love corporate art. And so that brings up a comparison between these two kinds of art. But as group two mentions, it seems that her main point is to uh, give more space for independent artists, even if you 
disagree very much with the kind of art that they make. OK, thank you. Other groups? Oh, you also mentioned the idea that uh, because these uh, uncomfortable and controversial works of art are important in the sense that they can bring a different kind of value to people who view them. It's something that, according to the author, we can't see from corporate art. And uh, why is different kinds of art important? That goes back to what we were talking about in question four and question three. Uh, art as a kind of human connection, as a way to understand other people and ourselves. If you only see corporate art, then your understanding of people and yourself will mostly be limited to what corporations give you, is uh, one of the points that the author is making. OK, thank you. Uh, other groups, do you want to add ideas to this question? OK, um, so. Next week, we're going to read. Um, a very long essay called on not reading DFW. DFW is a famous novelist from the US. His name is David Foster Wallace. Uh, he's most he's best known for his thousand page novel Infinite Jest. I'm not sure what the Chinese title is. I'm not sure there's a Chinese translation. Um, but many people consider him a genius. Many people think that if you are trying to understand contemporary literature, you have to read DFW. But the author of next week's essay is a scholar of contemporary literature, and she refuses to read DFW. Uh, and in this essay next week, she explains why. So um, it's a really long essay, 20 something pages, and it's technically an academic essay. Written for scholars and students of contemporary literature, but it's not as difficult as most academic essays for two reasons. One, it's a chapter of a book instead of an independent paper, journal, article. Um, and it, because it's part of a book, books are usually aimed for a slightly more general kind of reader. Um, so they tend to be less difficult than independent articles. The other reason is because, as she mentions in the essay, when she first started writing the essay, it was not as an academic essay. She first started writing it for a magazine. Called I think it was the LA uh, Review of Books, I think. So in the US and the UK, there are a handful of magazines that deal especially with literature and culture. Um, and they are called something something review of books. So you have the Los Angeles Review of Books. You have the New York Review of Books. You have the London Review of Books. Um, essays in these magazines uh, are aiming at the kind of reader who may not be an academic, may not be a professor, but they read a lot of books and they care about the culture of books and the ideas in books. So usually these essays are longer, ha are more detailed and uh, talk uh, about literature more in a more complicated way. But they are not as difficult as academic essays. Now, as the essay itself says, later on she decided to turn it into an academic essay. Um, so there, one of the questions I will ask you next week is uh, which parts of the essay 
uh, tell you that it is an academic essay? Like, how can you tell that it's academic and not popular, written for a general reader? Um, and so the author refuses to read the work of DFW. And the main reason is because DFW is a terrible person when he behaves toward women. Uh, and so that brings up the question of, should we ignore great work of art if the artist is a bastard? So that's the central question of next week's essay. Should we ignore art when the artist is a terrible person? If, uh, should we ignore good art, important art, if the artist is a terrible person? Um, it's very long, so uh, you don't have to understand every word and every detail. You only have to grab the main ideas. Um, and if you want a guide, you can look at my discussion questions for next week and focus on the things that I ask. So that's next week. Uh, we have a little more time this week, so let's jump back to page eight and we'll do a close reading from the beginning. Starting from the title. I don't want to grow up and neither can you. Do you guys notice something strange about this title? Is the grammar correct? It's not right. It should say and neither uh, do you. It's, a, it's actually a double joke. Um, back in the 80s and 90s, there, are, there were a lot of self-help books that said like, I lost 100 pounds in 10 days and so can you. That kind of title. And it's supposed to be like a positive title. It's an encouraging title. Uh, but because so many books uh, use this kind of title, it became cliche, and it became a kind of joke. So, for example, the comedian Stephen Colbert once wrote a book called I Am America and So Can You. Uh, the grammar is wrong as a kind of joke. But in this case, the author turned the positive sentence into a negative sentence. Before it was saying, if I can do it, you can do it. But here, the idea is, I don't want to do it, and so you should not do it either. So it's like two layers of jokes. Uh, and the thing that does not want to be done is to grow up. Uh, what growing up means, uh, we will we see as we read the essay. So starting from paragraph one, you can't show women being hurt. You can't show child abuse. You can't show rape. You can't show incest, pedophilia, self-harm, intimate partner abuse. Intimate partner abuse is what we used to call domestic violence. Um, uh, it's more proper to say it's intimate partner abuse because the word domestic implies that there is a home, there is a family. But in today's uh, society, especially in the West, uh, two people can have an intimate relationship without uh, having a home, without having a family. So the key idea here is not about being domestic or in the same home. It's the idea that these two people are intimate partners. Uh, necrophilia. In, in case your dictionary didn't tell you, necrophilia is sexual attraction to dead bodies. Violence against children. If you're going to so much as talk about any of these things, you need to do so at a fifth grade level and behind the dual firewalls 
uh, Fang Ho Chang. So a protection. Two layers of protection of safe pastel colored animation and explicitly education based presentation. Um, pastel is what we usually call a crayon lobby. Uh, so pastel colored animation is referring to uh, companies like Pixar who create uh, animated movies and cartoons with bright colors that feel welcoming and safe. And not only does it have to look and feel safe, it also has to feel educational. In other words, it has to be very clear what is right and what is wrong. The art has to show you in painstaking detail the exact way in which to behave. Again, very clear what is right, what is wrong. Even then, there's no guarantee it won't provoke a public outcry. Uh, I guess in Chinese we would call this Wai Jie Huaran. Doxing. And if your dictionary didn't tell you, to dox someone is to publish someone's personal information online. Uh, so like if I do something controversial and people on the internet are mad at me, somebody might track down my address, my email account, and publish it online so that everybody who is mad at me can like send me uh, letters, call me, uh, and basically harass me. Uh, in the worst cases, uh, doxing can include calling the police uh, with a false accusation. So like if someone was really mad at me, they might call the police and say like, oh, I'm abusing my family members and the police will come and arrest me or something. As a kind of harassment. Uh, death threats. So like if you keep doing this, I will kill you. That kind of idea. And even campaigns to strip artists of their jobs and livelihoods. A campaign is a series of organized actions. Uh, most often in English, we see political campaign, or like a military campaign, but here this series of organized actions is trying to uh, take away the jobs and work of artists that they don't agree with. So that's what the word livelihood means. Livelihood is something that you do to stay alive, to make money to stay alive. So this first paragraph presents what the author thinks is a big problem in her society. Which is there's this limitation on freedom of art and freedom of speech when it's related to these kinds of controversial issues. And even if you are very, very careful in presenting these issues, uh, you may still be publicly harassed and abused. Paragraph two, the idea that by depicting an act, an artist is endorsing that act seems baked into the minds of certain left leaning sets of younger people. Particularly teenagers and early 20 somethings. So in simpler English, uh, she's saying that apparently a lot of young people up to 20 something year old people seem to think that if something appears in a work of art, the author is supporting that thing. Uh, and of course, that's not necessarily true, right? That would be saying that would be like saying that uh, this Marvel villain wants to destroy the world and therefore Marvel Studios wants to destroy the world. It doesn't make sense. 
Um, and she mentions that these young people are often left leaning. So they're, they care more about things like social justice, equality, uh, discrimination, these kinds of issues. That they have such deep concern for the safety and social equality of their traumatized peers and the traumatized in their own ranks can only be admirable. So here the author is saying that the, these people, their intentions are good. Their intuitions are good, right? They want to protect other people, especially people who have suffered from trauma due to similar reasons as are presented in the art. So this part is OK, but more often than not, the form it takes is mass harassment and scapegoating, targeting not institutions or major studios, but independent creators. Many of them marginalize themselves. So the intuition is good, but the way that these people express their attitudes seems to be harmful. Mass harassment. Scapegoating. And their targets are often independent artists. Uh, people who already exist on the edges of society. We can think about this, right? Um, all of the artists that you know, all of the writers, painters, filmmakers. I'm willing to say that you know these people because they're famous. Independent artists, independent creators who are not famous, uh, therefore often lack the audience, they lack the money, the resources. Uh, they don't have the kind of safety that a more famous or a richer artist might have. Especially if the more famous and richer artist is a company. And that's why here she mentions that uh, comparing independent creators with institutions or major studios. In other words, big companies. Like if you get mad at a big company, they might lose money. But that's about it. But if you get mad at an independent artist and people uh, come together to harass the artist and to take away their work, the worst that could happen is you might uh, end up killing the artist. Whether because of uh, mental health, they might consider suicide or because they are not able to get work. Uh, don't have enough money to go to the doctor, especially in the US. So this is where we first see the author's comparison between independent creators and major corporations. If the whole thing sounds with its zeal for censorship and its self-righteous hate campaigns against the disenfranchised, a little like the American Family Association with a glittery coat of paint. Well, that's kind of what it is. So the American Family Association is a very conservative group of people who promote so-called family values, traditional uh, family values. So the, here the author is saying these well-meaning people, young people on the left who try to protect each other from having to experience uh, uncomfortable art. End up doing something very similar to what people on the right are also doing. Uh, promoting family values means like promoting art that does not have things that are uncomfortable. So even though the two sides believe in different things and they have different ideas, but the actions seem to have similar results. Uh, and these actions, the author mentions in this line, uh, third line from the bottom, with its 
zeal, which means energy or passion, for censorship and self-righteous hate campaigns against the disenfranchised. So, uh, as the author mentioned, like a series of actions to harass artists uh, out of a sense of justice. Right, that's what self-righteous means. It means you feel like uh, justice is on your side. Um, the disenfranchised here, it means the oppressed, the people who are often discriminated against. And so here she's talking about independent artists. Uh, the word disenfranchised, originally it means people who do not have the right to vote. But here the broader meaning is people who are not able to participate in society with the same amount of freedom and the same uh, amount of influence. Paragraph three. The usual arguments about Internet anonymity and the horrible deformities it breeds in human interaction all apply here. So here she's saying that um, people behave so terribly online. Uh, yes, because as many people say, you are anonymous on the Internet and people who do not have to take responsibility for their own actions often behave worse. So that's what she means when she says the horrible deformities. It which means anonymity breeds in human interaction. A deformity means something that looks uh, different, weird and ugly. The word breed here just means create. So like she's saying, most people will say people behave terribly on the Internet because they are anonymous. And here she says, yes, that's true. Uh, and there's much to be said of the young age and unformed personalities of the people perpetrating the worst of it. So on top of the problem of being anonymous, we can also add the problem that most of these are young people who are themselves still trying to figure out uh, what they believe is right or wrong. Uh, in other words, their ideas are not yet decided. And so maybe one day they think this is wrong, the next day they think that is wrong because they're still exploring their own ideas. Uh, that's what she calls unformed personalities. Their personalities are not yet decided. But so on top of these two common reasons, the author sees more reasons also. So the end of line three. But even older, more experienced art aficionados aren't immune to the fervor for purity in art. An aficionado is someone who is a kind of amateur expert. On, about something, so they don't have formal training. They didn't go to art school, but because they love art so much, they have a deeper understanding than the average person. So even people who are older and who know more about art. Also sometimes. Um, add to this problem. Aren't immune to in Chinese we would say ye bu mian. Fervor means passion. It's the same as the word zeal, passion, energy. For purity in art. And that's really what the author is describing, right? A kind of purity in art. Uh, the idea of purity here is like um, 
you know, like being good and moral and traditional. There seems to be a much deeper affection in these circles for corporate art. For the Marvel Cinematic Universe and its bland, calculated inoffensiveness, say, than there is for art made by artists. So among these people who are harassing independent artists, many of them seem to like uh, corporate art such as Marvel movies uh, much more than other kinds of art. And here in the middle, uh, she describes Marvel movies as bland, calculated inoffensiveness. Bland means not interesting. Calculated inoffensiveness means that these movies are carefully designed to not offend anyone, to offend as few people as possible. Uh, and then the word say just means for example. Uh, and then she she uh, continues by describing how many people think about Marvel movies as um, as an example. Movies like Wonder Woman and Captain America Civil War are evaluated with a generosity of spirit that borders on delusion. So people who really care about these movies seem to treat them very kindly. A generosity of spirit means um, in Chinese it's quan hong da liang. Like they're willing to overlook uh, the bad parts and emphasize the good parts. But it's so much that she says it's almost delusion. To border on means almost. Delusion means you're seeing things that are not there. Like um, hallucinations. And then she calls these people cults of enthusiastic acclaim forming around actress Gal Gadot's on-screen thigh jiggle and the subtle homoeroticism of Thor Ragnarok. Uh, so here she's bringing up two examples of things that fans have promoted as saying that these movies have a worthwhile message. The idea that um, the beautiful actress Gal Gadot is allowed to show some body fat. A jiggle is like tan tiao, is like uh, bouncing. So the idea that uh, the movie allows her to show extra body fat. Although, of course, she's beautiful. She doesn't have a lot of body fat anyway. And the other example is in Thor Ragnarok, the relationship between uh, the Thor and Hulk some people call that subtle homoeroticism, very hidden, like uh, gay energy, I guess we can say. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so I want to compare this sentence with uh, in the next paragraph, sentence five, line five. Fandom. Fandom is just the fans. Fandom's fixation on finding gay themes and subtext in these blockbuster juggernauts was more understandable when independent gay art was harder to find. Fixation means something that people are obsessed about. Uh, in the next line, a juggernaut is a, it, the original meaning is a huge battleship. But here it just means something that is very big and it's talking about big movies. So this sentence means that uh, like this kind of behavior, right? Seeing some kind of gay themes in Thor Ragnarok. This kind of attitude is more understandable when you couldn't find actual gay art. But here you can find gay art if you simply look for it online. And so this attitude seems to be very strange. 
Uh, in this same paragraph, she also gives two examples of Marvel movies that seem to promote negative messages. Line two in the middle. From the callous Islamophobia of the Iron Man movies to the US Air Force and CIA approved wokeness of Captain Marvel and Black Panther. So what does this mean? So like if you notice the Iron Man movies, uh, the enemies are often like Arabic people or they're fighting in the Middle East. And so that the idea is that kind of promotes the idea that uh, it, it associates Arab people with bad guys, even though it doesn't say that. But because most of the enemies are Arabic, viewers are uh, tend to get used to that connection. As for Captain Marvel and Black Panther, Captain Marvel, of course, trains with the US Air Force and Black Panther, uh, the, the white guy played by Martin Freeman, works for the CIA. And in both movies, uh, these the Air Force and the CIA are presented as good guys. So again, even though it doesn't say the army are good guys, it creates that connection in the mind of the viewer. So the idea here is that even when art doesn't seem to have a message, there is always some kind of idea in the work of art. When someone says that art is should not be political, they don't mean it shouldn't be political. They mean it shouldn't have a politics that I disagree with. Every work of art is political in some way. OK, uh, that's it for this week. Remember to read as much as you can of the essay before next week. And next week I will also pass out the next handout for the unit on uh, drama.